The world of Tom Clark is both very small and very large at the same time. It's very small during the week when I work in the studio and have little contact with the outside world. And then it's very large at the end of the week when I go to promotionals all over the country. So it's little at the first of the week and it's large at the end of the week. I went to one of my very first promotionals and there were a lot of people standing outside the store before I got there. And I thought, uh, I wonder if there's been a fire. And I got up to the people and said, uh, what, what's happening? And they said, we're waiting for Tom Clark. And I couldn't believe it. I do two types of statues. Miniature people, like a statue of you, would be small. Or a life-size wood spirit. When I'm doing miniature people, my country people, I'm drawing on my memories from growing up in a very small town. For my wood spirits, I have to start with a fantasy, which is these are real little fellas who live right around me. So an idea would be whatever they find in the yard, they'll play with. If it's a pencil, they may use it like a log. If you've dropped uh, an envelope, they may turn it into a pup tent. So my ideas come from starting from the fantasy. And the people who collect them have something in common, which is a love of nature and a feeling of joy and happiness. I often say to collectors, my little fellas have all of our virtues and none of our vices. They live for one day at a time. They try to see the positive side of things and not the negative. They like a sense of humor jokes that make themselves the funny object rather than their friends. They try to live as a friend and a companion to all mankind. Dr. Clark, I'm a school teacher and that's why I fell in love with Miss Mary. Could you tell me a little bit about her? I certainly can. Miss Mary is my second grade teacher. Actually, that's the name of a cousin of mine. And the statue I also put the dress of an aunt who taught second grade for 42 years. And my worst subject was spelling. So these are spelling papers in her hand that she's about to give back. It's the worst moment of the day. So everybody has brought her an apple. So the basket's full of apples. One student brought her an out rotten apple. Probably the fellow who also brought the slingshot that he shouldn't have in school. The find out book was my second grade school book. And the little uh, lunch pail has peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I'm sure they're very soggy inside. Uh, and there may be a comic book, because I love those, or a little frog, which once jumped out of my desk. Thank you. Could you tell me a little bit about where you're from originally? I'm North Carolinian. I grew up in Bladen County, tobacco country, and followed my ancestors to Davidson College. I went to Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, and got my PhD from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. After that, I returned to Davidson to teach religious studies. I've always been involved in art, so in Davidson I built a studio. I enjoyed painting there, but I found myself trying to sculpt the paint on the canvas. So I realized my true talent was in sculpture. Now I've been doing it for over 30 years and enjoying every minute of it. Dr. Clark, could you autograph my gnome? Be glad to. I just love candy. She does too. In fact, this was my candy that fell out of my box. I told her it was mine and to give it back, and she said, no, it's hers. So you have the H-E-R-S written on the candy there. I told her she really didn't need it because she had ample weight as it was. She pointed to the little coin that has a bird on it and says, I, I eat like a bird. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about the cairn? Cairn is a Scottish name. It means stone heap. In Scotland, they carry a stone to the top of a mountain and leave it there. And my house is built of stone. So I just called it the cairn. 
My studio is actually larger than my home. I start lots of statues, and I sort of move from one to the other, so I need a good bit of space. Now I need the space as well to display all of the statues that I've made, and there have been hundreds of them. I have a large yard, it's five acres, and it's always changing. So every day I like to go around and see what have I missed from the day before, what has come up, or what needs straightening up. As a child, I hated having to go in the yard and pick up sticks. As an adult, I love it. it gives me something to do and be in touch with nature. I'm one of those odd ducks that his favorite pastime is his work. When I'm sculpting, that's the most relaxing thing I do. Picasso says, art is a lie that tells the truth. I look at it entirely differently, though. I'm trying to say people are what matter to me. And it's not the way they look so much as the way they are. And I want the face to reflect an inner emotion. This is my friend the turtle, named Night Train. He's the minibus for my little fellas. Seven of them are riding him to a picnic. In fact, they're the seven up. And the names are Shasta and Tab and Sprite and RC and Doc, etc. They each carry a coin so they can pay for the ride. Train token, a subway token. Except for Pib, he has a parking token in case the turtle stops. He's looking toward the water right now. Only two can swim. So there are five lifesavers in the picnic basket. Well, here's O'Brien the shoe cobbler. He's a typical Irish leprechaun. He wears the green top hat and he sits on the side of the road, waits for someone to come along whose shoes hurt their feet. He repairs the shoes, gives them his necktie, which is a shamrock, and the luck of the Irish. Then they go on their way, and he goes back into the Irish mist. My little fellows don't play golf, but they live in the rough where a lot of golf balls wind up. If you like them, they'll help you find your lost golf ball. This eagle's nickname is Par. The little fella on top is named Bogey. That's one over Par. Underneath are Gimme and Stymie. That's two under Par, which is an eagle. My stories evolve. I don't start with a story and do a statue to match it. I do the statue and the story comes out of it. Dr. Clark, I've, I'm a little bit of a baseball fan and so I've picked Homer. Well, it's a little bit sitting on a baseball. <laughs> Someone hit this ball over the fence and it landed at his feet and he said, why it's named for me? It's a Homer. I don't know what team he's pulling for, but there's a coin with an Indian on it. So it may be the Braves or the Indians, maybe they're Cardinal Feathers. I don't know what he's saying either, but it's probably, uh, Mr. Umpire, please reconsider your decision. I like the older people that he does. I grew up in a rural area, and I like the expressions that he has on their faces. They remind me very much of my family, my neighbors, when I was growing up. Dr. Clark, I was just wondering, where did you get your start? How did this business get started? Not because of me, because I'm just a sculptor. But every artist needs someone who can market. I had done just a little stature of a wee person. It was in my studio when a former student and a friend of mine, Joe Poteet, saw it there. He conceived a business around reproducing this stature and others like it. When I saw the intricate detail that Tom was able to capture in the clay, 
uh, it became my job at that point to be able to reproduce that detail. Tom possesses what I call basically a sixth sense. He, he has a tremendous ability to, to capture expression and emotion in his statues. And it was this tremendous attention to detail that led us to produce these statues in a blend of polyester resins and crushed pecan shell flour, which enables us to capture much more detail than a standard porcelain figurine would. How long does it take to make a stature? I'm afraid I'll give a very flippant answer to that. It takes me about one week and 30 years. With 30 years experience, you can do something much more rapidly than if it's your first attempt. This stature that I am making will be Hike 2, a new version of my good friend Hike. In beginning this stature, I have to put clay on the base that will be the shape the finished statue will be. On top of that, I placed a little log, and it is the natural element that we'll see in the finished statue. I make leaves from leaves that are in the woods nearby. Just put them on a piece of clay and roll on top of them and pull it off. I learned that in kindergarten, and it served me well. I drilled a little hole in the top of the log and put some toothpicks in it. And this will hold up the clay as I begin to build up. I start from the lower portion of the body, in this particular case of height two, with his legs and his shoes. And I do it in colored original statue. We will have to pour the statue to get the first reproduction. So it's sort of exciting. We have a mix and it's poured into the mold. It will take around 40 minutes for this compound to set up. Then with great delicacy, the doctor, in this case the lady pouring the statue, delivers the statue. As soon as it hits the air, it begins to get very hard and very cold. 
but while it's in this stage, we can brush off any residue and clean up what seam there might be. Now it's ready for its first coat of paint. It goes to our head painter, who will test paint one or two reproductions. Then she and I will discuss what color patterns should be used. We might even vary the shade of several leaves on the same statue. And that's what we're talking about. From here, the paint will begin to set in and the staining process comes into play. The staining process is the most delicate, most important process regarding the finished look of this little fella. Finally, the felt has gone on the base and he's ready for packaging and being sent into the world. The next time I see him will be when someone hands him to me in a store and I'll say, well, hello there. I remember you being born. My family is just in love with all of Tom Clark's characters, especially the nativity set. And this is something that we hope to collect yearly and pass it down to our children and let it be an heirloom for, for years and years to come. Even though I'm an old bachelor, I have 400 children with me here in the studio, and they especially love the holiday season. On the night before Christmas, while Santa circles the house with his eight tiny reindeer, their counterparts, eight tiny wood spirits, are decorating the tree. Donna has a starfish that she'll put on the top of the tree, while the Blitzen, Peyton, has a sixpence he hopes to slip into her a slipper. She'll have to marry him then. The comet is Haley and the Cupid is Steubing. They're selecting the very best acorns and seashells for the decoration. The two clowns are Jean the Dancer and Mick the Prancer. And if they don't watch out, they'll knock over the tree. Louis the Dasher has a dashing idea that if you hold a seashell over a girl's head at Christmas Eve, she'll have to kiss you. Or so he told Alexis, the vixen. She's somewhat dubious. When Santa arrives, he's happy and tired. He's tired because he's been out all night. He's happy because all of this goes to your house. Not only is he happy, but so is the little Christmas elf who no longer has to empty that Play. Christmas is for giving and for saying I love you. And so is Valentine's. Little Val is standing on an ancient Pennsylvania Dutch Valentine with a brand new Valentine in his hand. He's been told he has to say to his girlfriend, will you be my Valentine? And he's afraid she'll say no. I gave him a little coin that says Island and I told him, now, Val, no man is an island unto himself. You have to give away your heart. Dr. Clark, will you tell me about the tooth fairy? Certainly. This is a grandmotherly tooth fairy. She's been picking up children's teeth. Maybe she got one of your teeth in here. Have you ever lost a tooth? I thought so. She's trying to teach you that you should brush your teeth, should eat apples to keep them clean, Use a little sassafras stick for a toothpick. Now, if you would like to have your dream come true, don't ask for a quarter or a dollar. Ask for a penny, because that makes good sense. I am to find this. My husband thinks he's somewhat of an athlete, and this reminds me so much of him, especially his facial expressions. I want all of my statues to smile, <laughs> and uh, this is the only one I've ever made that doesn't smile, but he makes me smile. Bubba's in training for the game, whichever game it is, perhaps soccer, like on the coin. He's trying to do 10 curls with these tinker toys that he's found in the woods. 
He's only done nine and a half. So you have to give him a little encouragement whenever you pass him in the house. Now right behind him is a little teddy bear and two little bells. Except where I grew up, we called them teddy bars. So these are teddy bar bells. Dr. Clark, you have created thousands of these wonderful creatures. How do you go about getting your inspiration for the next one? Well, I get ideas from people like yourself, from promotionals like this, but I need a chance to develop them, so I go to the mountains. The mountains have always been healing, uplifting for me. I grew up in the flatlands, and now a dream come true, I have a house on the top of a mountain. We're on Rattlesnake Mountain. That's the Blue Ridge Parkway down below. When they built that parkway over 50 years ago, they say they killed a lot of rattlesnakes around here. That's why they named this mountain Rattlesnake, but I call the top of it Cairn Ridge. When I'm in the mountains, I find myself imitating my own little people, like Ernest here. He's named Ernest because the Ernest Worker was a Sunday school pamphlet I grew up with. He's chopped his wood with a little ax from France that's on his lucky coin. On the other side is a little nut that shows a face, but only for those who believe in little people. Sometimes I like to watch birds, like my friends Audubon and Peterson. Audubon has made his own binoculars with a pair of acorns, while Peterson is practicing his best bird call. It's better than he thinks. He's already attracted a Carolina chickadee. I think one of the reasons I love to come to the mountains, it's where so many country people live, and they do the chores that I remember as a child, like Nellie here, who's snapping beans. My mother always said it was stringing beans, and she would give me a little bowl, and I had to sit beside her and had my own chore to do. On Sundays, of course, there were no chores of this sort, so the ladies and the husbands and children like myself would all meet at the country church, somewhat like this one, where I found the tombstone that said Enoch. When I finished my statue of the farmer, I didn't know what to call him until I saw this tombstone. Then I thought of Enoch in the Old Testament, who lived 365 years. The Bible doesn't say he died. It says he walked with God. Well, farmers are like that. They work 365 days a year, and they walk with God. I start with the belief that the universe is basically friendly. Therefore, its creator is too. And if my little fellows have anything profound to say, it's that they are your friend and they love you. This is Pastor Patterson. When I finished Divinity School, I went to work for a minister whose face and name I placed on this statue. I was his assistant in charge of a little country church where they couldn't afford a ministerial gown, so I wore a choir robe. There were always hymn books at my feet. On this pulpit are symbols from the early church, Jesus as the Good Shepherd. On the front, are the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and a cross of St. Martin's from the island of Iona in Scotland. On this side, it's what he's preaching, Christ, of course, and the Trinity, but the seashell that stands for James contains the sermon that was directed at me, for I was soon to leave and become a college professor. The third chapter in the first verse says, let not many of you become teachers, 
or you shall be judged with greater strictness. Just as a photographer may spend a lot of time outside, he still has to come inside for developing. I spend a lot of time with people and I get good ideas, but I need a quiet, solitary place for developing them. So I come to the mountains, to the quiet Blue Ridge Mountains. And he said, you'll never make a businessman. So uh, it, would, it would thrill him to see that people have actually come here to buy <laughs> from me. Uh -huh. Another reason I like being here, uh, I travel all over the country now. Uh, in fact, tomorrow I'll be in New York. Uh, but they don't understand me up there. They understand me here with the southern accent. Uh, I have two, I have several strikes against me, but two especially. I can't spell worth anything, and I can't change this southern accent. Well, I, I was in Michigan recently working on a little fellow like this, and this couple, old, older couple came up, uh, not as old as my statues though, and uh, he said, um, what is he doing? Uh, you know, I can't hear like that. And she said, I don't know what he's doing. What are you doing? I'm putting a bib on the little statue. She said to him, he's putting a bib on the little statue. <laughs> I said, no, uh, a, a bib, a bib, right, a bib, B-R-E-A-D. He's putting bread on the little statue. <laughs> One thing I find when people come up to me at promotions, the look on their face tells me that I've met them before. And I will often say, now where did we last see each other? And they'll say, well, we've never seen each other before. And I've been coming to realize that they feel a kinship with me and I with them. We share some things like a love of nature and a love of people. I get letters from them, which has been fun for me every day when the mail comes. These little people that I have made have become parts of other people's lives. I love hearing about that. Dear Dr. Clark, after admiring your work in the homes of friends and relatives, I have begun collecting it myself. Today I went to a local shop and arranged to take Nellie home with me. Dear Dr. Clark, I am 10 years old and I collect your gnomes and wood spirits. Dear Dr. Clark, I just wanted to write this note to let you know how much pleasure Hike has brought me. His beautiful face, sparkling eyes, and big smile just make me smile every time I look at him. He is much loved. Dear Dr. Clark, as a new collector, I want to tell you how much I enjoy your artwork. I was first attracted to gnomes because of their unique appearance and the way they interact with objects from our daily lives. Dear Tom Clark, I met you at a recent promotional. I just want to tell you what a clever man you are and what joy you have brought to many of us. Thank you for signing all my artwork. What a thrill to meet you. God bless you for the joy you bring many of us. Dear Dr. Clark, thank you for the warm reception funny stories, and kind thoughts. We love you.